All right, picking back up on page 139, agency disclosure. So now we've talked about the different types of agency relationships in North Carolina. We talked about single agency. The firm represents only the buyer and only the seller. We talked about dual agency and true dual agency, which is where all the agents or all the brokers within that firm represent both the buyer and the seller at the same time. We talked about designated dual agency, where the firm represents both the buyer and the seller at the same time, but we've sort of picked one broker to rep represent the buyer and another broker to represent the seller. So because that's a lot of possibilities, right? We need a way to disclose or tell, convey to the public where we are on that spectrum. You got to let people know. They don't know necessarily that the person they're talking to may represent them or may represent somebody other than them. So we need some way to tell the public, this is who I work for. And we do that with a form that you're going to love for the rest of your career. Uh, it's on page 141 uh, and 142 in your book. And it's really tiny because it's a brochure. I have a, a real one over here. I had one and somebody stole it. I used to have one on the podium. I'm sorry? They might have the day pass stole it, probably. Um, I'll find you one. But it's a brochure. It's got a purple cover. It's a trifold or fourfold brochure about this tall and this wide. Um, the key here is you don't have to use it in that brochure format. It's okay to use photocopies of it. It's okay to use it on legal paper as long as you've got the same verbiage. What you can't ever do is change the verbiage of this form. This form comes directly from the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. Okay? And you are required to give it to every potential client with whom you cross a certain threshold. You reach a certain point with this person and you're required to give them this disclosure. Okay. What did I say my golden rule of real estate was? Talk about what, not what. Property, not, Property, not people. Well, folks, in our business, we represent people. And eventually, the conversation is going to have to turn to them. What kind of house do you want? Why do you need this type of house? What price point are you? Why do you want to be in this neighborhood? How much can you afford? Are you going to be paying cash? Are you going to finance? Isn't all that people, right? At some point, the conversation is inevitably going to turn from property to people. The Real Estate Commission gives a fancy name to that point in time. They call it First Substantial Contact. It says the mandatory working with real estate agents brochure must be given and reviewed at first substantial contact of every sales transaction. So when did I say that fancy phrase, first substantial contact, actually happens? When you stop talking about property, you start talking about People. So let me give you an example. Let's say I'm holding an open house. If I hold an open house, just out of curiosity, who am I probably representing? The seller, most likely, right? Okay. So I'm holding an open house, and Isaiah comes to the open house on Saturday because he does not have anything better to do. And so he comes in there to look, and he likes free cookies, so he goes and eats the free cookies in the kitchen, and he walks around the house. And I tell him, of course, if he has any questions, I'll be glad to help him. And he walks around, and he looks, and he comes back downstairs. And I say, well, did you have any questions about the house? And he, goes, and he says, yeah, how much is it listed for? And I say, $225,000. We talking about property or people? Right. Property. He says, well, how many square feet is that? I said, 1,900. Property or people? Property. So at this point, we haven't crossed that threshold, you're right? Okay. Um, he says, well, how many bedrooms is it? I said, there's four bedrooms, property or people? Property. property. What school district is it in? And I say, well, the elementary is Farmington Woods and high school is Cary High. Um, we property or people? Property. property, but we're getting closer to what? People. people. And as soon as I say Farmington Woods, he says, good, because my little boy 
goes to Farmington Woods already. And if I buy something, I want to stay in that same district so he doesn't have to change schools. Talk about property or people now. We have shifted gears, right? He has given me some kind of personal information about himself. Now, who did I say I represent? Would the seller be interested in knowing that this potential buyer wants to buy something in the Farmington Woods district because their son already goes to school there and they don't want to change schools? Yes. Yeah, because they might pay more for that, right? This buyer might be motivated to pay more for that. Because of that, we've crossed that line. That is first substantial contact. And at that point in time, you have to give that person this document. But don't focus on the document. The document is not the most important thing. The piece of paper is not the most important thing. The most important thing is to have a conversation with this person that's in front of you. All right? So this is sort of a three-step process. Right? For me, this is a three-step process presenting this document. And you're going to get so comfortable with it, you can do it in 30 seconds. Look how long it is. You're going to be able to do that in 30 seconds. Max. Because you're not going to read the damn thing to him. Nobody wants to be read to. You start reading it to him, he's going to do one of two things. Either completely turn you out or just turn around and walk away. And he's gone. Right? Yes. Sure. So if he just says to you, I want to stay in the Farmington Woods School District, that's great I'd say that's probably still because he used what pronoun? I. I'd say that's probably still for a substantial contact because he shared he wants to stay in that district. I'd say that probably still is. On a on a test, it will be much more clear than that. It'll be clearly something where they cross the line. Okay, but I'd say that's probably first substantial contact. Now remember, first substantial contact is the last time at which you can do this. You could always, if you were concerned about that, what would be the best thing to do? Just, just go ahead and present the thing. You know, if you think, well, was that first potential contact? Just go ahead and present it, because you can't over-disclose, right? There's no such thing as over-disclosing here. So, the, the, I keep saying disclose. What would I be disclosing to him? My, what would I mean by disclosing my agency? Who am I there representing, folks? The seller. Who is he? A potential buyer, right? So the first thing I need to tell him is what? I represent the seller. I represent the seller. That is the first piece of information that I need to give him when I'm presenting this document. Hey, Isaiah, let me stop you right there and just let you know I represent the seller. How many of you watch cop shows? Like, or have watched cop shows, or Law and Order, or SVU, or whatever? So you're familiar with a Miranda warning, right? Mm -hmm. Miranda warning is, that, you know, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can or will be used against you in a real estate transaction. Isn't that what they say? Yeah. Because that's exactly what this thing is. Essentially, what I'm telling him is, you just told me something that my client might be interested in. Let me let you know I'm working against you so you don't do what? Keep talking. You don't have to tell me anymore, Isaiah, because I represent the seller. I just want you to know that. Now, am I going to say those are the exact words? No. What I'm going to say is, Isaiah, before you go any further, let me let you know that I do represent the seller. So I have completed step one of that process, which is to disclose to this person where I stand. Am I on the sidelines or am I in the game? In this case, I'm very much in the game. I'm on the seller's side, right? Does everybody follow that? That's step one, disclose. Step two is explain the document to them. Now, I know it's really small in your book right there, and I don't want you to read, so it's actually beneficial, because I don't want you to read the, the verbiage. But if you look, there's a section for sellers, and there's a section for buyers. And, am I going to explain to him the section for sellers? No, because no, he's not what? He's a buyer. So I'm going to explain to him the section for buyers. Now, explaining does not mean going through and reading that section to him. It means explaining to him how I might potentially work with him on this transaction or any other transaction. Because that's really all we care about is how we might potentially work with him, right? So at that point in time, what are the ways I might potentially work with him? I've got to know that before I know how to continue with the conversation. I'm sorry? What kind of agency, though? How might I potentially work with him? Dual. dual agency, right? It might potentially be dual agency if he is what? 
If he's interested in this listing, because I already said I represent who? So I'm already halfway to dual agency, right? And if he's actually interested in this listing, I may end up in a dual agency situation with him, right? So do I need to explain to him dual agency? Yes. Maybe so. Probably so, right? What's a, another potential? It's, so how can it be exclusive buyer agency? I said I represent the seller. He might give me information that he doesn't like this house, but he saw another house down the street that he might be interested in. Am I interested? I'm, I'm not done with him, right, at that point. What would I like to be? His buyer's agent, right? So the other potential I have for him is buyer agency, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a third one you haven't mentioned yet, which is actually the most obvious one. Mm -hmm. Seller what? What's the next phrase there? Well, that, that agent working with a buyer but representing the seller. Seller sub-agency is the third, where I just stay, I'm on the seller side, right? That would be him saying, well, you know, I really like the house, but I already have an agent, or I'm not interested in having an agent, right? At that point, he doesn't want to work with me to represent him, so that eliminates dual agency, right? Mm -hmm. That eliminates exclusive buyer agency. That leaves me with what? Sub Seller sub-agency. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I've got these three possibilities in my head. Now, am I just going to start blathering and explaining all three of them? Or am I going to ask him a couple questions to get a feel for where I need to go with this thing? Ask him some questions. Ask him some questions. What's the best first question I can ask him? Even before that? Even before that? Even before that? Say that again. What do you think of this house? Because, folks, I may eliminate the whole damn dual agency, seller, sub-agency right there in one shot. If he says, I don't like this house... Do I need to explain dual agency to him? No. Do I need to explain seller sub agency to him? No, because no, the only option at that point is for me to be what? His buyer agent on some other house. You see how easy that is? That one question, and I guarantee you there's nobody in the state that teaches this better. And I'm not saying that to be arrogant SOB. I'm just telling you right there, that's the best explanation you're ever going to get about this damn document. So you better learn it. Okay. Somebody else will teach you this thing. It'll take you three hours to figure out how to present it. I'm going to do it 30 seconds. I'm, I'm not kidding. Okay. Ask them simple questions. What do you think of the house? He says, I don't really like this house. And back of my mind, I'm thinking, all right, eliminate dual agency. Don't even talk about it. Right? There's no need. Because why would I waste his time explaining to him something that's not going to happen? Right? I've eliminated seller sub agency. Does it matter that I represent the seller anymore? No, because he's not interested. So at this point, the only thing I needed to explain to him is what? Buyer agency. So what I would immediately say to him, and this is this is my whole explanation of buyer agency. I'd be like, you know, I'm sorry you don't like this one, but you know, if you give me an idea of what it is you might be interested in, I'd be glad to search the MLS and even set you up on a little automated search. You get emails whenever something came on the market. You'd know what was out there. What did I just ask him in a very roundabout way? Are you interested in maybe working with me as your buyer's agent? Now, am I, now am I saying, do you want to hire me right on the spot? No, because that's too pushy, right? But I've explained to him what service I might be able to provide at this early juncture, right? The point here is, if he walked away from that conversation, and somebody walked up to him and be like, hey, who's that dude over there? He'd be like, oh, yeah, he, you know, he's the listing agent. He represented the seller, but... He offered to send me some listings, too. I think I might take him up on it. If, the, if he could give that kind of a description, the real estate commission would, would be like, oh, I thank you so much. Because so many agents don't ever get to that point. They look at this thing as some kind of a burden, right? It's just some stupid form i got to get signed. And they focus so much on getting the thing signed that they forget the purpose of the form in the first place. It's just to have a conversation. And meanwhile, it's a conversation you're going to be having anyway. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a conversation you would naturally have. It just flows. That also means the conversation is not going to be the same for every situation. You can't just learn a script with this. Well, you can, but you, the problem with that is you're going to be saying things that don't really apply to them, right? What if I'm not talking to you? It says it must be used, and this is one of those test things. I'm going to point it out. 
reviewed it first substantial contact. Well, we said that's when we start talking about what? People instead of property, right? At first substantial contact of every what kind of transaction? Sales. Every what kind of transaction? Sales, Sales transaction. So, do we do this in leases? No. No. If you see a test question that says presented at first substantial contact in every transaction, is that true? No. No, because every transaction includes what transactions? Leases. Leases. So it's every what kind of transaction? Sales. Sales. Well, so far, I've only talked about presenting this to a potential buyer. Isn't a seller also involved in a sales transaction? Yes. So how would I present this to a seller? I'm sitting down and I'm meeting. When would I be meeting a seller to have first substantial contact? At their house. At their house to do what? Why? To, to, to potentially list it, right? Isn't that when you meet sellers? When you go talk to them about putting their house in the market, potentially? So, the first step, I said, is always disclose, right? Disclose. At that point, what am I disclosing to them? Am I disclosing, I represent you? No, because I don't represent them yet, right? Am I disclosing that I represent the buyer? No, I don't represent the buyer. So, who do I represent? So, from a transactional standpoint, who do I represent? Nobody yet, right? So that should be kind of the first thing I say to them is, look guys, you haven't hired me yet. That's how you say I don't represent anybody yet, right? You haven't hired me yet. Now, I'm going to delve a little bit further into this thing. As we talk about agency relationships further, we're going to talk about the duties that we owe our clients. One of them is called loyalty. We owe our clients loyalty. And loyalty means keeping their confidential information confidential. Has this seller hired me yet? No. So do I owe them the duty of loyalty yet? I do not. So one of the things I would want to disclose to a seller in that situation is to simply say to them, until you have decided you want to hire me, you shouldn't tell me anything you wouldn't want a buyer to know. Because here's the thing. This is exactly how I explain it to sellers. I'm pretty sure you're talking to more than just me. You're probably interviewing several listing agents, right? How many of us can you hire? One. One. So that leaves the rest of us that you've had conversations with out there potentially representing who? Buyers. Buyers. So I would be doing what? Working for you or against you? Against you. Against you. Isaiah, you know, I appreciate you meeting with me tonight. Let me let you know, first of all, you haven't hired me yet. So... Please don't tell me anything you wouldn't want the seller to know, like maybe what price you'd be willing to sell for. I mean, anything you wouldn't want a buyer to know, like maybe what price you'd be willing to sell for. Because here's the thing. If you don't hire me and I end up representing you, representing a buyer against you, you're going to be in trouble because you've already told me exactly what you would sell your house for. And I, legally, I would have to disclose that to my client, the buyer. Wouldn't that be kind of a conversation you could have with a seller? Folks, if you're that bluntly honest with the seller, you know what you're going to walk out of there with? Right. A listing. Now, would you... Okay. Never mind. I was going to say, would you actually say that? I know it's not... 100% absolutely say that. Okay. Absolutely. But I mean, I feel like I know a lot of operators who might not. I feel like I know all of them who won't. Not <laughs> might not, won't. You know why? Because this happened after they got their license and or the person who explained it to them make it sound like a damn burden rather than something commonsensical. So they look at it that way. They look at it as some piece of paper they got to get signed versus some conversation they should be having with this person. I'm going to tell you the truth, and this is the honest truth story, and I'm going to get to Tang's question. I did that in a listing presentation years ago, and I went in and I sat down with the, the buyer and the seller, I mean the sellers, husband and wife, sitting down with them, and they had a whole stack of books they had gotten from other listing agents where they had interviewed like seven agents that day. And I sat down with them and I said, first of all, I know you've probably heard this from several other agents and I pulled out the working with real estate agents brochure, right? And I've caught this look between them like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And it's not unusual because a lot of agents don't do it the way they're supposed to, right? And I, and I said, I said, but I need to remind you that you can only hire one of us. So please don't tell me anything you wouldn't want a buyer to know, you know, like a potential sales price 
unless you do decide you want to hire me. Because you can only pick one of us, and if you don't hire me, it's very likely I could end up representing a buyer against you because I do a lot of work in this neighborhood. And I don't want to know something that would hurt you. I don't want to have that information, so please don't share it with me unless you decide you want to hire me. Do you know that the husband looked at the wife and he said, if the rest of them won't tell us that, what else are they not telling us? And they signed the listing. They didn't even ask me what I charged. And they signed the listing. One sentence. That easy. And that's what they want you to do. That's the conversation they want you to have. Because isn't that what's fair to the client? Isn't that what is in their best interest so that they understand what the heck is going on here? So you're going to change this conversation based on your situation and make it easy. I hear agents all the time so frustrated with this thing. They, they say, I can't get people to sign that thing. I just met this person, you know, just met them. And three, three minutes into meeting them, I got something that, that they have to sign. I said, well, first of all, you're wrong about that. So, test question, do they have to sign and working with real estate agents brochure? No. no, I just told you, they don't have to sign the thing. You know what my attitude is about them signing it? I don't give a shit whether they sign it or not. I don't care. You know what that almost always leads to? Them signing it. The surest way to have them sign it is you not care whether they sign it or not. Because if you're sitting there and your hands are shaking, you well, you know, the real estate commission said, now I have to give this to you. So, um, and it says right here, if you're a seller, that um, you might hire me to be your agent. And can you read over that and sign it for me? That person's going to be looking at me like, uh oh. -huh. I'm not signing that. Even though, and I'll say, oh, but it clearly says over here, this is not a contract. Like, I'm not signing it. I'm sorry. I'm, I just don't sign it. You know, that's what they're going to do. Get defensive, right? Close off. But if you just tell them something simple like, listen, you should know, honestly, that you shouldn't share a bunch of information about yourself until you hire somebody. Because only one of us can work for you. Everybody else is going to be working against you. And that's basically what this document says, but it takes 500 words to say it, and I just said it to you in 10. You know? So please, we'll go through and we'll talk about what your house might be worth, but don't share things with me that you wouldn't want a buyer to know unless you've already decided you want to hire me. If you, want, if you decided you want to hire me, please feel free to share anything with me because I'm going to protect that information. But I don't want to be in the situation of having your personal confidential information if I don't represent you. I don't even ever mention about signing the thing. And you know what they more nine times out of ten say? Well, do I need to sign this thing? I see here it's got a place for me to sign. They'll ask me if they need to sign. You know why? They're comfortable. They're comfortable that I'm not trying to take advantage of them. They're comfortable that I'm not shoving something in their face. Does that make sense? If you present it in that way, you'll get the signature. But if you don't, who cares? The Real Estate Commission tells you. You don't have to get it signed. What you do have to do is present it. There, there's a difference there, right? Mm -hmm. So if they won't sign it, what do you do? Wait, so you date initial it. You date initial it. What I've actually, what, what I've actually asked them, you know, the, the few times that I've had people who wouldn't sign it, I've said to them, I've wrote them that would not sign. I'm like, you know, would you initial here that you would not sign it? You know, most people will do that if they won't, even if they won't sign it. And if they won't initial it, I just put or initial it, and I sign it myself. Because at least I've got some record that I presented the thing, and that's all you need. You just need some record that you presented it. That's it. Okay? Now, I want to point out a couple things about the signature panel on the form. And I know it's hard in your book. I wish I had a real one. I'm going to bring a copy on Thursday night of real ones. Um, but you see the signature panel there? It's the bottom thing on the page. If you turn your book sideways, it'll be all the way on the right. Does everybody see the signature panel there? At the very bottom, and I know it's strange eyes to look at it, at the very bottom in bold, can anybody read what that heading says? Disclosure of blank. Disclosure of seller sub agency. Now, what did we say was going on when we have seller sub agency? An agent who's working with who? Working with a buyer, but representing who? The seller. The seller. seller sub agency, the agent working with a buyer, but representing the seller. So, what do you think we're disclosing here? That situation. We're just reminding this person, hey, I recognize you're a buyer. I want you to recognize that I represent who? The seller. 
seller. The seller. So when would you fill out this section at the bottom when you represent who? The seller and the person signing it is who? The buyer. The buyer. That's what that section is for. Okay? And it just says there, when showing you property and assisting you in the purchase of a property, the above agent and firm will represent the seller. For more information, see seller's agent working with buyer in the brochure. And they're going to initial it down there. So if you happen to be the seller's agent, you would have them initial in this section, if they're willing to. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So when do you present the thing? First substantial contact, which is when we start talking about people versus property, right? And we cross that boundary between people and property. I'm actually sorry, because I'm really confused. That little statement says, insuring property is assisting you in the purchase of a property. I mean, it's not just this, if it says something like this property, you know, because I'm sitting here showing you the house or whatever. Then I'm a seller, so they just, but if I'm assisting you in the purchase of a property, just a different property. A property, I'm not. So what would you what would you do if that relationship changed? You'd probably just get them to sign another form that didn't have that part initial. Oh, okay. All right. So you would only have them initial that section if they were actually interested in that property you were showing that particular one. If he said no, I'm not interested in that particular property, then you're not going to have them initial that section because. You're not going to be representing the seller. Yeah. I guess I just felt like it was a yeah. like more specific. I got you. I got you. But it is a specific thing, specific yeah. to that property. Okay? So you're going to keep the acknowledgement panel. The set, the, you're going to let them keep the brochure. You're going to keep the signature panel. Okay? Hey, Travis? Yes. You said this wasn't always the case. So when was it like it? When did this become the law? You're going to laugh when I say it because I make it sound like it's a recent thing, right? Yeah. 1995. Before that, just... before that, you didn't disclose anything. But, but remember, before that, you didn't have buyer agency. There was nothing to, you know, it was, it should have been understood that all the agents represented the seller, right? And this is nationwide? This is not. This is a North Carolina specific form. Now, every state has some form of this now, but this is just our version of it. And it's called the Working with Real Estate Agents Brochure. This last one down here is step three of the form, which I haven't really explained to you yet. A lot of people assume step three is getting the signature. Again, I don't care about the signature. I, I want you to try to get the signature, but that's not the ultimate goal. Step three, step one is disclose your relationship, right? Step two is explain to them how you might work with them. Step three is to get them to make a decision about how they might work with you. Remember with Isaiah's example, he told me he wasn't interested in the property. And I said, look, well, if you tell me what you are interested in, I'll be glad to send you some listings or set you up on a search. How does that sound? What am I trying to get him to do? To Commit to something, right? Because at that point, it's a yes or no answer, right? If he says, no, don't worry about it, what's his decision? Yeah. He doesn't want to work with me. If he says, yeah, that sounds good, what's his decision? Yeah, he may work with me. You see how we've gotten him to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if it's taken more than a minute, you're doing it wrong. You're going too much. You make you put. You see what I'm saying? Don't make it such a burden for yourself. Make it part of your normal conversation. You'll get comfortable with it. I promise you. It'll take a while. First time you present it, you will be sweating. The palms will be sweaty, clammy. You'll be all over the place. I'm going to give you a recommendation about that first time you're out with a client. We all have it. And uh, you'll be scared to death. There is no way around it. I don't care how many times you've been out with somebody else. It just is. You're going to be scared. To, and the thing you're going to want them not to know is that you're scared to death. Right? One way you can help alleviate that. Because most of you are going to be working in residential real estate when you first get into the business. And most of the time, that first time out with a client is going to be a buyer client. You're going to be taking a buyer out to show them property. Go preview the property ahead of time. If you're showing them five houses, the day before you go, set up all five of them and spend your day going and looking at those houses and learn everything there is to know about those houses. Because that way, 
when you walk in the front door of them, you show it them like an expert. You, that's that. You need a crutch to fall back up on. You need something to talk about so you're not sitting there. Because here's what you're going to be doing. You're going to have them listen to she's in your hand. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, oh, um, yeah, um, uh, 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 taxes are uh, 1%. Yeah, um, they're gonna be, and they're going to be more nervous than you are at that point, right? You're ready to get the hell out of there is what they're going to be ready for. Because they sense it. It's like blood in the water. They know you don't have any experience. But if you walk in that house and you don't give them time to think you don't know what you're talking about, because you can't, you sh you're touring them at that point in time, right? You're like, this house has a first floor master. It's over here. It's got a nice walk-in car. I know that sounds stupid, but that little thing can give you enough confidence to make it through that day. And if you get through that day, you'll get through all of them. If you don't quit halfway through that first day when you're out with them, you'll make it. I promise. But that thing can give you the confidence to actually take them around and show them so you're not floundering so much. Okay? Obviously, that's not on the exam, but it, it, you know, real world stuff is helpful every once in a while, too. Okay? Any questions about this disclosure statement? The working with real estate agents brochure. What kind of transactions do we use it in? Sales. All sales transactions. When do they get it? First substantial contact. Good. Good. Three years. You have to keep all your records three years from the end of your brokerage service. So if it's a sales transaction, when is the end of your brokerage service? Closing. Closing. Okay. Buyer agency. We talked about this already. We can have oral buyer agency. There are some rules that go along with it, though. The first one is it is non-exclusive. What does that mean, non-exclusive? They agree though with whoever they want to. They are not dating just you. You are in an open relationship. You can go with whoever you want to. They can go with whoever they want to. Because you have not agreed to an exclusive agreement. Here's what that means in the real world. This is what that means in layman's terms. It means you're going to get screwed. Because <laughs> what's going to happen is you're going to work with this person for three, four weeks, a month. You're going to take them around and show them 30 properties. Meanwhile, when it gets time to make an offer, they're going to call their cousin who lives in Clinton to come up here and write the offer for them so their cousin can get paid. And you did all the work, and how much you can get out of it? Nothing. Nothing. If you want to get paid, what do you have to have? A written agreement, right? So that right there should be reason enough to get a written agreement. You shouldn't need a better reason to get a written agreement. Because the only way you can make sure they are tied to you and your firm is to have a written agreement. And the only way you can make sure that, they are, that you're going to get paid is for them to be tied to you and your firm. So if that, if for no other reason, get a written by our agency agreement. Now, I would be dishonest if I told you I always have a buyer agency agreement the first time I go out with somebody. In fact, my general rule of thumb is I'll go out and show anybody property one time without a buyer agency agreement. They don't know me. They haven't worked with me. They don't know how I work. I don't know how they would be as a client. It's a lot to ask somebody to commit to you for several months, just sort of sight unseen, right? So, I have, but I do have my own sort of internal personal policy that if they want to go out a second time looking, we put down a written by agency agreement. And what I tell them is this, I want to protect you and your information. I can't do that without a written agreement. So, We've been out looking one time. I think you feel comfortable that I know what I'm doing. I think you feel comfortable that I'd be a good person to represent you. If you do, let's go ahead and put it in writing. Do you have to do it for six months, three months? No, you can do it for a week, right? Because in my experience, you can do it for a day. In my experience, if you can get them to sign it one time, you can get them to extend it, no problem. The key here is getting them to sign it the first time. Does that make sense? So get it in writing. When does it have to be put in writing? 
by the time you put in an offer. Okay? So, question. Sure. On this, when you say uh, having extended, extended for, so when does this expire? Whatever date you put on it. Remember, agency agreements have to have an expiration date. So, whatever date we put on there. We could make it for one day. I could take them out showing properties today, mm -hmm. and it could expire today. You know, and that's a good way. To, that's a good trick to get them to sign it the first time, right? If you just say to them, "Listen, I just want to make sure you're protected. The only way I am bound to protect your information is if we have a written agreement. So why don't we just sign it for today? If tomorrow you don't want to work with me, no problem. This thing's over with." But getting them past that point where they're willing to sign it one time is a big hurdle. So once they've signed it, the next time you talk to them, they'll be happy to extend it in most cases. Because obviously if they're calling you back, they want to continue working with you, right? If they were willing to sign it the first time for one day and they come back for another day, they're going to be willing to extend it. And you're not going to extend it for one more day. You're going to extend it at that point for a couple months. You're going to actually make it meaningful. Does that make sense? All right. Let's see here. Um, I think that is a good stopping point for tonight. All right. We will get into the duties you owe your clients on Thursday night. Thursday we will finish chapter 7, obviously, and, which is not much left. And we will cover basic contract law in chapter 8, um, maybe start on chapter 9. So I would have read from 9. So will we have a quiz Monday? Probably not. Probably won't have